Good morning, everyone. So for today's discussion, we'll be talking about three topics, which is a statement of changes in equity, the accounting changes specifically for accounting estimates, and accounting changes specifically for accounting policy. So these topics are just very short. That is why they are combined into today's discussion. So let's start with the statement of changes in equity. So our objective for this topic is to understand, of course, the concept of equity, to know the preparation of the statement of changes in equity, to identify the different components of equity, and to identify the items directly affecting retained earnings. So let us define what is equity. So equity is defined as the residual interest in the assets of an entity after deducting all of the liabilities. So in other words, equity is the equivalent of what we also know as your net assets. So that is your total assets minus your total liabilities. <clears throat> so equity and net assets can just be interchangeable. So when you're asked for the net assets, of course, what is meant by that is your equity. Same with if you are asked for the equity, it's just basically your net assets. So, although equity is defined as a residual, it may be subclassified in the statement of financial position. So, there are different subclassifications of your equity. And these are the following. So, first we have the share capital. So, this classification or subclassifications are applicable to corporate entities, specifically those entities who are offering stocks. So, we have... Of course, your share capital, which refers to the funds contributed by shareholders equal to the par or the stated value. So take note, your share capital is equal to your par or stated value. While share premium, also known as reserves, re refers to the funds contributed by shareholders in excess of your par or stated value. So later on, we will see an example of the difference between share capital and your share premium. And lastly, you have the retained earnings, which can be subdivided to either unappropriated and appropriated. So, we will discuss in detail later on all about the retained earnings. Now, the holders of the instruments classified as equity are simply known as the owners of the entity. <clears throat> So, owners is the general term. Now, let's move on to the statement of changes in equity. So, this um, statement is a, or this is a formal statement that shows the movement in the elements or components of the shareholders' equity. So, examples of those components are what I have mentioned in the previous slide. So, those subclassifications. Now, an entity shall present a statement of changes in equity showing, first, the comprehensive income for the period. Because as you know, diba, your um, comprehensive income will be transferred or closed to your um, retained earnings, which is then reflected in your changes in equity. And another is that for each component of equity, the effect of changes in accounting policies and correction of errors. So let's another another um, entity that should be present in your components of the shareholders is yeah, for each component of an of equity a reconciliation between the carrying amount at the beginning and end of the period separately disclosing changes from profit or loss each item of other comprehensive income and transactions with owners in their capacity as owners showing separately contributions by and distributions to owners so these refer to your dividends if you are giving out dividends or you can have withdrawals but if you're dealing with um sole proprietorships so 
we will take a look at this example to further understand the components of your statement of changes in equity. So as you can see here, you have the company name or the heading, of course. The Junisha Mawala, you have the company name. What kind of FS is that? Uh, what kind of component is that? Component of FS is that? And then you have the period. So take note, your statement of changes in equity follows the year ended. So it is the same with your um, income statement. Next is, as you can see here, of course, you have your beginning balances. And then it is divided into three, which is your share capital, your reserves, and your reta retained earnings. So as you can remember, these were the subclassifications mentioned in the previous slides. So that is your beginning balances. And then you have the correction of errors resulting from prior period, period under depreciation which is recorded under retained earnings. You also have changes in accounting policy, which is also recorded under retained earnings. And then as you can see here, the issuance of um, shares. So your share has a par value of 100 pesos. However, it was issued at 150. So under share capital, again, what is recorded here is the equal value with your par or stated value. So if you are issuing 10,000 shares at its par, so that is 1 million. So 10,000 times 100, that is 1 million. And of course, the excess, which in this case, the excess is 50 pesos, multiplied by the number of shares issued, that is 500. So that is how you get the share capital and reserves, which I hope you already know based on your um, accounting to a partnership and corporation. So this was discussed in detail there. Now we also hear another example. In this case, it is a preference share. <clears throat> so another component is the comprehensive income, which again it was stated that the profit um the net income or profit or loss is separated or is disclosed separately. So you have your net income also again and the retained earnings. You also have OCI, and then you have your dividends and your current appropriation for contingencies. So you will get the ending balances. So this is just an example of how a company can present their statement of changes in equity. So you can have the subclassifications in this method, or you can have it in a horizontal manner so it depends as long as these components are shown in your statement of changes in equity next let's move on to your statement of retained earnings so the statement of retained earnings of course shows the changes affecting directly the retained earnings of an entity so the statement of retained earnings is now a part of the statement of changes in equity so not um, the companies are really not required to have a separate statement of retained earnings. So um, usually they just integrate it or combine it or, sh let, or show it in the statement of changes in equity. So the, the changes in your retained earnings can be found or is not as mentioned, part, is now part of your statement of changes in equity. So there is really no, there is really no, separate mandatory statement of retained earnings that is required in each company so again as i mentioned it is now part of your um, sce so the following data affecting the retained earnings that should be clearly disclosed in your statement of retained earnings are the following so of course you have your net income or loss for the period you also have your prior period errors you have the dividends declared and paid to shareholders, effect of change in accounting policy, and the appropriation of retained earnings. So, let's um, discuss one by one these items that directly affect your retained earnings. So, first is you have the net income or loss for the period, which is... I know you already know what these refer to. So when you say net income, net income is of course added because it increases retained earnings while net loss is deducted because 
it decreases retained earnings. Now, another item is the prior period error. So, the prior period errors are shown as adjustment of the beginning balance of your retained earnings to arrive at corrected beginning balances. So, if the net income of the prior period is understated, the amount of error is, of course, added to your retained earnings. Now, if it is the opposite, wherein your net income for the prior period is overstated, of course, the amount of your error is deducted from your retained earnings to reflect the correct beginning balance for that specific period. Another item is your dividends to shareholders. So, the dividends declared or paid during the year shall be a deduction to your retained earnings. Another item that affects your retained earnings is the effect of change in accounting policy. So, this is just like the prior period error is also shown as an adjustment at the beginning of the or at the beginning balance of the retained earnings. So, if the net income of the prior period is understated because of a change in accounting policy, the effect or no, yeah, the effect is added to the beginning balance of your retained earnings and. The opposite would apply if if your net income is overstated. Of course, it is a deduction to your beginning retained earnings. So, more likely, it is just the same with your prior period error. But in this case, the change was brought about by, or yeah, the adjustment was brought about by a change in your accounting policy. So, <clears throat> now there are also some components of your other comprehensive income that are subsequently reclassified to your retained earnings. So, aside from those things that I mentioned. Now, another item that affects your retained earnings is your treasury shares. So, if you can remember in your um, partnership and corporation accounting, diba? if you are issuing treasury shares, you are required to appropriate a certain amount. Now, if you are to retire those shares, of course, if the cost of the share, if the cost of the treasury share is more than the original issue price, then the difference is charged to your retained earnings. So, that is how it affects your um, retained earnings. And lastly, we have the conversion of preference share into ordinary shares. So, in this case, if the total par or stated value of the ordinary share is more than the original issue price of the preference share, then the difference is charged to your retained earnings. Again, if your total par or stated value is value of your ordinary share is more than your issue price of the preference share, the difference is charged to your retained earnings. So, it is not a share premium or a reserve, ha? It is considered as part of your retained earnings. <clears throat> now, as previously mentioned, retained earnings is divided into two. You have, or maybe divided into two, which is unappropriated and appropriated. So, when we say appropriated, it, um, the amount of appropriation is deducted from the unappropriated balance of the retained earnings. So, when you say appropriated, means that amount is separated because it has a specific or allocated use. So, um, conversely, if the appropriation is subsequently cancelled, it is reverted or added back to your unappropriated balance. So, your retained earnings may be appropriated for the following reasons. So, first, you have the legal requirement as in the case of your treasury shares. Another is your contractual requirement as in the case of bond redemptions. And lastly is your entity policy as in the case of an appropriation for contingency. So, examples of this entity policy is when a company would decide to appropriate part of their retained earnings if they want to accumulate um, 
a large amount or if they want to accumulate an amount specifically for their expansion or purchase of um, PPE in the next period. So usually there is an appropriation or the company would appropriate a certain part of their retained earnings. So again, that is just based on the company policy. Now we have here an example of your <coughs> statement of retained earnings. So again, you have the um, beginning balance with the prior period error, or correction of the prior period error. And then you also have the change in your um, accounting policy. So as you can see here, it, it's said that it is the corrected beginning balance. So then you add the those items directly affecting your retained earnings. So you have your net income, dividends, and operations for contingencies thus arriving at your um, uh, retained earnings ending balance so again as I mentioned not all, not all companies um, specifically separate a statement of retained earnings most of them just integrate it or combine it or it already shows in their statement of changes in equity so that is all about statement of changes in equity. So as I mentioned, this is just a very short um, topic. So that's basically what you need to know about equity. Now let's move on to our next topic, which is accounting changes, specifically a change in accounting estimate. So our objective is to first identify the categories of accounting change, to understand the concept of a change in accounting estimate, and to know the recognition and reporting of change in accounting estimate. So what are your categories of accounting change? So I already mentioned this a while ago. You have the change in accounting estimate and you have the change in accounting policy. So in this specific part is we will be talking about accounting estimate and then later on we'll be talking about accounting policy so accounting changes can have a great impact on an entity's reported earnings thus it is critically important that users of financial statements understand the nature and effect of accounting changes and must not rely solely on the bottom line which is the net income or loss so let's talk about the first category with it, which is a change in accounting estimate so according to pass 8 paragraph 5 <clears throat> excuse me it defines a change in accounting estimate as an adjustment of the carrying amount of an asset or a liability or the amount of the periodic consumption of an asset that results from the assessment of the present status and expected future benefit and obligation associated with the asset or simply stated um, when you say uh, when you say a change in accounting estimate it is a normal recurring correction or adjustment of an asset or liability which is the natural result of the use of an estimate so you know that diba, <clears throat> in your intermediate accounting your previous topics you've already encountered estimations when you estimate for doubtful accounts diba? so you apply estimation there so if again if there are um, corrections or adjustments to your estimations <clears throat> then the change in accounting estimate would apply so the use of reasonable estimate is an essential part of the preparation of your financial statements and does not undermine their reliability <clears throat> so an estimate may need revision <coughs> excuse me um, an estimate may need revision if changes occur regarding the circumstances on which the estimate was based or as a result of new information, more experience, or subsequent development. So, 
Of course, since they are just estimate, they can be subject to changes, especially if um, the changes that happens to them are really material. Diba? So, again, basis of estimate may result as uh, may may be as a, may be a result of the company or the entity gaining new information which does not make the new or the old estimation valid already or it is not really relevant or does not really give reliable reliable information or a reliable result or the estimation does not give reliable result already so then that is when the company may change their accounting estimate so, by very nature, the revision of the estimate does not relate to prior periods and is not a correction of error. So, again, it does not relate to prior periods and it is not a correction of an error. So, account change in accounting estimate is different from your prior period errors or correction of errors. Now, a change in measurement basis is a change in accounting policy and not a change in your accounting estimate. So, this is where the confusion come in, wherein you need to identify or it would be confusing to identify if it is a change in accounting policy or is it a change in accounting estimate. Now, if it is a change in your measurement basis, meaning how would you the basis of your recognition measurement and recognition of the specific component for example asset layup or so on but it is not considered as a change in estimate but rather it is a change in policy so again as i mentioned it is often very difficult to distinguish a change in accounting estimate and a change in accounting policy now in such case the change is treated as um, accounting as uh, account, change in accounting estimate with appropriate disclosures. So again, it is only treated as a change in accounting estimate if the entity would find it really difficult to distinguish if it is either a change in accounting policy or a change in accounting estimate. So if, again, if maglibog na guys si entity kung unsa yung gamitan sa duha. The default is your change in accounting estimate. However, you need to disclose that again. You need to disclose that you you um you chose it or you classify this as a, as a change in accounting estimate because you found it hard to um, distinguish which is which. Diba? So again, there should still be pro proper disclosures. Now let's move on to the examples of your accounting. Estimate. So, as a result of the uncertainties in business activities, many items in financial statements cannot be measured with precision but can only be estimated. Estimation involves judgment based on the latest available and reliable information. So, estimates may be required for the following. So, as I mentioned a while ago, you have your doubtful accounts, which I believe is the most common or most well-known um. Uh, application of your estimate, the doubtful accounts, and then you also have your inventory of solid sense. You have the useful life, residual value, and expected pattern of consumption of benefit of depreciable assets. You have your um, warranty costs, if you can remember in your intermediate accounting. You also have the fair value of financial assets and financial liability. So these are just some of the examples of your accounting estimates now how do you report changes in your accounting estimate now the effect of a change in accounting estimate shall be recognized currently and prospectively again it is currently and prospectively one way for you to help remember this one is that accounting again you should, you should remember that accounting estimate is not considered as a prior period error so when you say prior period, diba, um, first thing that would come into your mind is retrospective if it is a prior period error. However, since a, a change in accounting estimate is not a considered a prior period error, meaning your recognition of it would be currently and prospectively. So it is included in your income 
or loss in the period of change if the change affects that period only and the period of change and future period if the change affects both so letter a is applying it or recognizing it currently or in the current period and letter b is recognizing it currently and prospectively so again it is included in your income or loss not in your retained earnings okay so <clears throat> to the extent that a change in accounting estimate gives rise to changes in assets and liabilities or relate to item of equity it shall be recognized by adjusting the carrying amount of the related asset liability or equity in the period of change so a change in an accounting estimate shall not be accounted for excuse me shall not be accounted for by restating amounts reported in the financial statements of prior period again shall not so of course, this means that there is no retrospective application of your change in accounting estimate. So, changes in accounting estimates are to be handled currently and prospectively as stated a while ago. Now, prospective recognition of the effect of a change in accounting estimate means that the change is applied to transactions, other events, and conditions from the date of change in estimates. So, let's have an example. So, for example, a depreciable asset costing 500000 is estimated to have a life of 5 years. At the beginning of the third year, the original life is changed to 8 years. Thus, the asset has a remaining life of 6 years. So, again, it, the useful life, as you can remember, estimation of a useful life is considered as a change in accounting estimate. So, from five years, now at the start of the third year, it is changed down to eight years. So meaning there is an additional na, um, two years, uh, no, not two years, but three years. So that is why the asset already has a remaining life of six years. Now the procedure is not to correct past depreciation. So instead, the re the remaining carrying amount of 300,000, which is of course your 500,000 minus your accumulated depreciation of 200,000, is now allocated over the six years, which is the new useful life. I mean, six years, na siya. or a subsequent annual depreciation of 50,000. So, thus, you have the entry of for the third year depreciation of. Um, 50,000 and a committed depreciation of the same amount. So, again, you did not change the depreciation of the prior period. Diba? You're already, you are only applying it to the current year, which is the third year, and to the years to come. So, until mahurot ang iyang six years. <clears throat> so, it is currently, or the application is currently and prospectively so again a change in the depreciation method or a change in the use, useful life rather is accounted for as a change in accounting estimate now another change in your depreciation is your change in depreciation method so if there is a change in depreciation method it is also accounted for as a change in accounting estimate. So, we have this example. So, an entity decided to change from sum of the year's digit to straight line method on January 1, 2020. So, the asset has a, has a cost of has an has originally has an original cost of 1 million, which is a quarter of January 1, 2018, and estimated to have a four year life so if you apply the syd method you have the carrying amount of 300,000 by january 1 2020 so january 1 2020 is a period wherein you change the depreciation method so from syd to straight line so by Jan by january 1 2020 starting this period until the end of the life of the asset it would already follow the straight line method so in this case, 
since the asset already um, has a two years two years of its life already expired so the remaining two years would follow the straight line depreciation method already so thus you have a or you need to record a depreciation for the current year at the amount of 150,000 so that's simply the carrying amount divided by the useful life remaining useful life of the asset so again change in depreciation method is considered or is accounted for as a change in your accounting estimate so this is or just a this ends the accounting cha accounting changes specifically change in accounting estimate so just a recap again your change in accounting estimate should be applied currently or should be recognized currently and prospectively so modern, that's just one thing that you need to remember with um, account or changes in accounting <laughs> estimate. So lastly, let's move on to the third and last topic, which is your change in accounting policy and prior period errors. So our objective is to understand the concept of a change in accounting policy, to know the recognition and reporting of a change in accounting policy, to know the guideline when selecting accounting policy in the absence of an accounting standard, to understand the concept of prior period errors, and to know the recognition and reporting of prior period errors. Now, let's start with accounting policy. So, what is an accounting policy? So, accounting policies are specific principles basis, convention, rules, and practices applied by an entity in preparing and presenting financial statements. So, accounting policies are essential for a proper understanding of the information contained in your financial statement. So, an entity is required to outline all significant accounting policies applied in preparing financial statements. So, if you can remember, or if you're familiar in your notes to financial statements, there really is a part there that is allocated for you to outline or to list down the significant accounting policies applied in that um, financial statement of yours or financial statement of the entity. So, under the accounting standards, alternative treatments are possible. So, in this case, it becomes all the more important for an entity to clearly state the accounting policies used in preparing financial statements because as I mentioned, there is alternative treatments can be possible. So the entity shall select and apply the same accounting policies each period in order to achieve comparability of financial statements or to identify trends in the financial position, performance, and cash flows of the entity. So. That is why accounting changes in accounting policies um, least likely happen because the company would want to maintain its consistency and for them to be able to achieve comparability of their FS. So once selected, accounting policies must be applied consistently for similar transactions and events now a change in your accounting policy shall be made only when you have first it is required by an accounting standard or an interpretation of the standard so meaning the standard itself says that you need to change your accounting policy for this specific let's say asset or liability another thing is when the change will result in more relevant and faithfully represented information about the financial position, financial performance, and cash flows of the entity. So, what are the examples of your change in accounting policy? <clears throat> so, again, a change in accounting policy arises when an entity adopts a generally accepted accounting principle which is different from the one previously used by the entity. So, examples of change in accounting policy are... <clears throat> First, you have a change in the method of inventory pricing that is from FIFO to your weighted average method. 
Next, there's a change in the method of accounting for long-term construction contracts from cost of recovery method to percentage of completion method. Another is the initial adoption of pol policy to carry assets at revalued amount is a change in accounting policy to be dealt with as revaluation in accordance with your past 16. Another is a change from cost model to fair value model in measuring investment property. And another example is to change to a new policy resulting from the requirement of a new PFRS. So, <clears throat> if you may notice, these changes are usually changes in the measurement of your specific asset or liability. So, how do you measure? So, again, as previously mentioned in the previous topic, your changes in measurement method is considered as a change in your accounting policy. Now, if you have these examples as a change in accounting policy, you also have the following examples which are not considered as changes in accounting policy. So first, the application of an accounting policy for events or transactions that differ in substance from previously occurring events or transactions. And another is the application of a new accounting policy for events or transactions which did not occur previously or that were immaterial. So again, these are not considered as changes in your accounting policy. Policy. So, given these examples, how do you report a change in your accounting policy? So, again, if you can remember, in your accounting estimate, is it is recognized currently and prospectively. In this case, <clears throat> a change in your accounting policy required by standard or interpretation shall be applied in accordance with the transitional provisions therein. So, if you can remember when we talked about IFRS 15, but there were tra uh, transitional provisions that were included in that specific IRS. So, again, the company had options on they would like to apply it prior to January 1, 2018. However, from January 1, 2018, it should be applied. All should follow the application of the IFRS 15 and so on and so forth. So again, there were transitional provisions that the company or the entity can choose to follow. Now, if the standard or interpretation contains no transitional provisions, again, there is no transitional provisions, or if an accounting policy is changed voluntarily, the change shall be applied retrospectively or retroactively. So again, it is different from your accounting estimate. Your accounting estimate is currently and prospectively, your accounting policy is retroactive or retrospective. So when you say retrospective application, it is applying a new accounting policy to transactions, other events, and conditions as if that policy had always been applied. So again, you apply it as if that policy had always been applied. So, imuha siyang change back from the very beginning. It, as mentioned, as if wala kay change or as if mo na siyang policy mo you apply since the beginning. So, that is why it is retrospective, retroactive. Now, past 8. Paragraph 22 provides that an entity <coughs> excuse me, shall adjust the opening balance of each affected component of the equity for the earliest prior period presented. Excuse me, and the comparative amounts disclosed for each prior period presented as if the new policy had always been applied. So, simply stated, when you say retrospective application, it means that any resulting adjustment from the change in your accounting policy, it shall be reported as an adjustment to the opening balance of your retained earnings. So, if you can remember, in our example, in this, when we were talking about statement of changes in equity, but there was a part there which there was a change, or part of the example was a change in your accounting policy. So, again, it was considered or it was added to your um, it was added to your retained earnings or it can be deducted. Again, it depends if it would, it is an overstatement or an understatement. So, uh, 
one thing is for sure, the adjustment is made to your opening balance of the um, retained earnings. Now, the amount of the adjustment is determined as of the beginning of the year of the change. However, the adjustment may be made to another component of equity, not retained earnings, in order to comply with another standard. So, if comparative information is presented, the financial statements of the prior period presented shall be restated to conform with the new accounting policy. Now, the impact of the new policy on the retained earnings prior to the earliest period presented shall be adjusted against the opening balance of your retained earnings. So, let's have an example. So, an entity has used the FIFO method of inventory valuation since it began operations in 2019. The entity decided to change to the weighted average method for determining inventory costs at the beginning of your um, 2020. <clears throat> so again, the company has been applying the FIFO method for one year only. That is for the year 2019. So for 20, you have December 31, 2019 under FIFO, its inventory cost is at 1 million, under weighted it's at 750. December 31, 2020 under FIFO, it is 1 million, 1.5 million, and under weighted it is at 1.2. <clears throat> now remember, your FIFO inventory by January 1, 2020 is at 1 million. However, you are to change it to weighted. Now, according to weighted, it's your ending inventory should only be at 750. So, that is why at the beginning of the year, you should, beginning of 2021, you should identify or recognize a decrease in your beginning inventory in the amount of 250,000. So by January 1, January 1, 2020, you recognize a you have a decrease in your retained earnings. So debit retained earnings of 250 and you decrease the inventory. So credit with the amount of 250. So the computation of the cost of goods sold for 2020 would then show a beginning inventory of 750 and ending inventory at 12 to conform with the weighted average method. So the statement of changes in equity for year ended December 31, 2020 would show the effect of the change of 250 net of tax as a deduction from the beginning balance of your retained earnings. So that is what you mean by retrospective application. Now, retrospective application also has its own limitations. So, um, retrospective application of a change in accounting policy is not required if it is impracticable to determine the cumulative effect of change. So, this especially happens if the company has already been operating for a very long time. Diba? In a previous example, it was easy to determine because the company has only been operating for one year. Now, if the company is, let's say, operating for 50 years or even 10 years diba? or 20, how many more years, it is difficult to determine the effect of the accounting policy because remember, diba? you would adjust it as if there was no change in your policy in the first place. So, kay kayun panimuhan to dito sa year one ni mga mga transactions, di ba? So, again, it is impracticable. So, applying a requirement of a standard, impracticable, when the entity cannot apply it after making every effort to do so. So, for a particular prior period, it is impracticable to apply a change in the accounting policy when the effect of the retrospective applications are not determinable. The retrospective application requires assumptions about what management's intention would have been at that time. And then the retrospective application requires significant estimate and it is impossible to distinguish objectively information about the estimate that provides evidence of circumstances that existed at the time and would have been available at that time. So, again, these are the limitations of your retrospective application. So, 
mostly these limitations are set by the time difference especially when you are um, when you made the change diba? and when your company really started so these are just some of the limitations now let's talk about perspective application a perspective application if you can remember in your um, changes in accounting estimate it means that the new accounting policy is applied to events and transactions occurring after the date at which the policy changed so if you can remember but one of the um, one example of your change in accounting policy is that if there is a new accounting policy that the company did not apply in the previous year year or it was immaterial on their part diba? so when you have when you when you do pers or when it is impracticable for an entity to apply a new accounting policy retrospectively again as mentioned by the limitations because you can, the entity shall apply the new policy prospectively from the earliest period practicable so in other words if the amount of the adjustment on the opening balance of the retained earnings cannot be reasonably determined the change in your accounting policy should be applied prospectively so in the, no adjustments relating to your prior periods are made either to the opening balance of retained earnings or other component of your equity because existing balances are not recalculated so that is what you mean by your perspective applications. Next is your change in reporting entity. So a change in reporting entity is a change whereby entities change their nature and report their operations in such a way that the financial statement are in effect those of a different reporting entity. So for example, um, this accounting change may result from changing the specific subsidiaries comprising the group of entities for which consolidated financial statements are presented. So, of course, there will be changes in your subsidiaries that since you are presenting it consolidated, it is expected that there will really be changes. So, a change in reporting entity is actually a change in accounting policy. So, again... It is considered as a change in your accounting policy. Thus, it shall be applied or treated retrospectively or retroactively to disclose what the statements would have looked like if the current entity had been existent in the prior years. So, in other words, the financial statements of all prior periods presented shall be restated since, of course, it is retrospective. To show financial information for the new reporting entity. Now, what if there is an absence of an accounting standard? So, Pass 8, Paragraph 10 provides that in the absence of an accounting standard that specifically applies to a transaction or event, management shall use judgment in selecting and applying an accounting policy that results in information that is relevant to the economic decision making needs of users and is faithfully represented so paragraphs 11 and 12 specify the following hierarchy of guidance which management may use when selecting accounting policies in such circumstances so first you have the requirements of current standards dealing with similar matters Second is the definition, recognition, criteria, and measurement criteria and measurement concepts for assets, liab, income, expenses, and the conceptual framework for financial reporting. And lastly is that most recent pronouncements of other standard setting bodies that use a similar conceptual framework and other accounting literature and accepted industry practices. So again, this is your this is the we this will serve as a guide for management if ever they find it difficult to determine what specific accounting policy should be used so they can follow this hierarchy first one is a second is b and third is the c 
Now, last topic is about prior period errors. So, prior period errors are omissions and misstatements in the financial statements for one or more periods arising from a failure to use or misuse of reliable information that was available when the FS for those periods were authorized for issue, and second, could reasonably be expected to have been obtained and taken into account in the preparation and presentation of those financial statements. So, errors may occur as a result of either mathematical mistake or mistakes in applying accounting policies, misrepresentation of facts, fraud, or simply oversight. So, how do you treat prior period error? So, if you can remember in our statement of changes in equity, Diba? Prior period errors has the same treatment as your accounting policy. So, it shall be corrected retrospectively by adjusting the op opening balances of your retained earnings and affected assets and liabilities. So, if comparative statements are presented, the financial statements of the prior period shall be restated. So, as to reflect the retroactive application of the prior period errors at a, as a retrospective restatement. So, retrospective restatement means correcting the recognition, measurement, and disclosure of amounts of elements of financial statement as if a prior period error had never occurred. So, in other words, the net income, its components, the retained earnings, and other affected balances of your prior period presented shall also be adjusted. So, if the error occurred before the earliest prior period presented, the opening balances of your assets, liabs, and equity for the earliest period prior period shall also be restated. Now, when it is impracticable to determine the cumulative effect at the beginning of the current period, of an error on all prior periods, the entity shall restate the comparative information to correct the error prospectively from the earliest date practic practicable. So basically, it has the same treatment as your change in accounting policy. Rest change in accounting policy and your prior period errors. So the following are the disclosures that should be applied in your prior period error. So first, you have the you need to disclose. The nature of your prior period error, the amount of correction for each prior period error presented for each practical uh, to the extent that is practicable for each financial statement line item affected and for the basic and diluted earnings per share. You should also disclose the amount of correction at the beginning of the earliest prior period presented and if retrospective restatement is impracticable for a particular prior period. The circumstances that le led to the existence of that condition and a description of how and from when there has been corrected should also be disclosed. So let's have an example. During 2021, an entity discovered that certain goods that had been sold during 2020 were incorrectly included in your December 31, 2020 inventory. So meaning these are, these are already sold, so they should not be part of your um, inventory for the year ended 2020. The accounting records of for 2021 before adjustment revealed sales of 5 million and cost of goods sold in the amount of 3 million. So the adjustment of December 31, 2020 to correct the prior period error is of course a deduction to your retained earnings because again this should not be part of your um, inventory and uh, credit to your inventory or cost of goods sold depending on what method the company is using whether perpetual or periodic so you have the amount of 300,000 300, then accordingly the partial income statement for 2021 would appear as follows you have a sales of 5 million and then the cost of goods sold in the amount of um, 2 million 700 so you have a gross income of only 2 million so, the change has already been applied in the year 2021. So, that ends the discussion on your statement of changes in equity, statement uh, 
accounting changes, specifically a change in your accounting estimates and the change in accounting policy and prior period error. So if you have questions, just post it in our um, queries and concerns forum or in our official group chat.